Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. This is Ernie Humphrey. I am the CEO of 360 Thought Leadership Consulting. I would like to welcome you to my webinar today, Mastering the Art of the CTP Exam, What You Need to Know. A little background about myself and why we're here today. I've been a CTP for over 10 years now. I used to work at the AFP. I'm a frequent speaker at AFP regional events, and I began teaching CTP certification courses last year overseas. What I started to notice was that some of the difficulties people were having in passing the CTP exam were more about the questions themselves, uh, the psychology that people were experiencing as taking the exam, and issues that weren't related directly to the content of the exam. So I started to notice that and I started to make notes of all these generalizations that I was making. And I also offered folks the opportunity to, to have a copy of my CTP study battle plan template that I give to all the attendees of my course. And the demand for that was higher than I thought. So that kind of inspired me to have this webinar today. So hopefully we'll offer you an ROI for your time today. If you're taking the exam, hopefully it'll offer you some good tips, any questions that you have up to the exam and during the webinar, um, feel free to ask those to me. A few other housekeeping items. I'm going to go ahead and send you the uh, link to the presentation tomorrow um, along this weekend at some point and also a recording of the webinar. Um, as far as questions are concerned, I'd love to hear your questions during the webinar, so please ask me your questions in the questions box in your GoToWebinar control panel. Another note, I'll be switching back and forth on my screen, so be patient with me as I toggle uh, back and forth as we go into the AFP learning system and other resources that I'd like to share with you that can help you in passing the CTP exam. So a little bit of a background on our presentation agenda. Uh, we'll look at um, four common pitfalls that I've seen that people have in, in CTP exam preparation. My seven steps to CPT exam success that I share with all my folks that take my course. Um, a lot about the psychology of the CTP exam and what I've seen and some tips that I think can help you the right mindset and get there in, in not only taking the exam but studying for the exam as well. I'll review the customizable CTP exam study template that I help people create. So after the webinar, I'm happy to work with this on any of you as well. Share with you the art of studying smart and test taking tips and I'll offer some closing thoughts and then we'll have some Q&A. Happy to stay on the line as long as you'd like with, with your questions and again also any questions after the webinar, happy to go through those uh, to you as well. So some of what I call the four common sins of CTP exam preparation. Um, first would be cramming for the exam. So no matter how smart you are, you're really not going to be able to cram for the exam. A point I'll make here is that if you can get away with doing some of these things and pass the exam, more power to you. But I've found that 99% of the people cannot get away with these things. And so that's why I offer these as things that you should not do. So cramming for the exam, um, I learned this myself. I had a lot of trouble taking the practice exams um, when I first started studying way back when I took the CP exam. I found out really quickly that job experience is no substitute for getting the exam questions correctly. So again, the first two are related. Don't cram for the exam. You're not going to be able to cram in everything a week before. Um, you shouldn't assume your work experience or places you need to study. Uh, you, you have to study. Each person has different areas where they need to study, but you will need to study. And one of the things I suggest that everyone needs to study is how to take the the exam, which means taking practice questions, doing as many as possible. Um, again, some people don't work on the, enough CTP exam practice questions. Uh, they assume that they know how to answer the questions. The wording is tricky. There are certain types of questions. You will talk yourself into answering certain types of questions wrong. You want to make sure you work through that. And then the other common sin that I see people is they don't have a detailed exam strategy. So I think it's something that is best done in pieces. So wh what I do is I suggest people have a weekly study strategy. You have a certain list of tasks you need to get done every week. 
and then make sure that you check off those tasks. And what those tasks are and how long it takes are going to be dependent on the individual person, but these are things that I would not do. Again, don't cram for the exam. Don't assume because you have work experience that's going to replace your need to study. Um, don't think you don't need to work CTP exam practice questions, as boring as that may be, and make sure that you don't make the mistake of not having a detailed exam strategy. It only takes you uh, maybe an hour or two, or in working with me less than that, to come up with an exam strategy, and I know the amount of time and money that you invest in preparing for the exam, so you want to give yourself every opportunity for success. I'll stress that again. Always think about how much time and energy you're putting in to sitting for the exam. All these tasks and all this time, you want to make sure you're realizing the ROI of passing the CTP exam. My, so my seven steps to CTP exam success, um, some of these we will we'll go through in further detail, obviously, but you want to understand your resources at your disposal from the AFP. There are a lot of resources that AFP offers. Some of those are free and some are not. The main one that I recommend that everyone purchase is the AFP Treasury Learning System. If you can pass without it again, that's fantastic, but there, I don't think there are a lot of people that are, have success on the exam without leveraging that particular tool. Um, again, and so that leads me to our next step, purchase AFP's online Treasury Learning System. Um, three is something that some people I tell to do it at the beginning and some people I tell to do later. Um, there is a AFP learning system pretest that tests your knowledge in the five areas which the exam covers and lets you highlight areas where you may have some skills gaps and where you may need to spend the most time studying. You'll want to identify specific knowledge and skills, gra skills gaps. You will want to work on a CTP exam battle plan. You'll want to study smart and stay on your path. Don't get behind. And of course, the last path, last is master your content and have that exam strategy. And then let's uh, pass the test. So I'm going to go ahead and toggle us up here. And we'll just go ahead and um, take a look. Um, within the, um, but for first, let's go ahead and get my screen over to the right area here. So this is um, from the AFP website, and so these are just some of the tools um, that the AFP offers. Again, there's the, we'll, we'll click in here in a moment. There is the AFP Treasury Learning System. It's an online system. We'll take a look at that in just a moment. There's other resources as well. The AFP has a CTP preparation guide. It has helpful test taking tips and strategies and has 170 sample test questions. So this document is quite valuable. I'm going to go ahead and we'll take a quick uh, look over here. Um, but there's, there's just a lot of good information in here. So sometimes I find that people, um, it, the part of the, part of the issue they have is they just don't realize all these resources exist. So, so if we take a quick look here. Um, and this document you can download um, from the AFP, but it just got some of the some of the topics that I'm covering here, all those other topics. So it tells you um, test taking strategies, um, test taking tips. We'll go over some of these areas in detail. It really outlines the structure of the test. So if you're a really organized person, you want to really dissect this. It's, it's a great way to do it. So it tells you what are the five domains. That's the way the learning system is structured, and it tells you exactly how the test is scored. So if you really want to get analytical about it, it tells you how much of your time you might want to allocate to certain areas, so certain types of questions. A lot of times people get really tied up in the computational questions, the formula questions. They are very important, but you have to keep in mind the 15% um, of the exam. So I would recommend that uh, you download this this guide, and also um, it has 170 questions um, in here, which is fantastic to practice. Uh, and so, if you don't if you don't have the resources to purchase the AFP learning system, and you want 170 sample questions and the answers, um, you can go ahead and download those uh, as well. So, fantastic tool. Um, AFP also has um, some webinars. So, AFP also has their own. Uh, webinars that they offer on exam preparation 
in a lot of the topics that I'll cover today. So those are some, some great resources that the AFP has. Um, now let's take a look at what I mentioned, the um, AFP uh, Treasury Learning System. So, uh, so uh, to take a quick walk through here, this isn't meant to be a product demo for AFP at all, believe me. Those of you who know me know um, I wouldn't do that. But this is a very valuable tool. So the, the learning system helps you study for the exam in accordance with the five modules that we have. All these resources, is the main menu are important. There's a, one of the things to each module, there's a quick start. These videos are, are actually much more compelling than I imagined. So there's a module quick start which, which gives you a great overview of what's covered in that specific domain. So if you're in the process of studying for the exam, hey, I haven't looked at module four for a while, I want to get a high level overview, I would go ahead and just watch that module four quick start. So each module has tests and then there's flashcards you can print and help you learn the content as well. And just an, just an example for those of you who aren't familiar, so with each module there is a test. So it'll, it'll allow you to set up a quiz, test your knowledge in an area. So it'll take you through questions, and then obviously you read the questions. The cool thing about this system is, let's say I answer B, and I say, oh, my answer's wrong, which is oh, usually if you're doing a practice test, it doesn't really help too much. They do a really good job in explaining the rationale um, for the test. So what is it that you, uh, what's the right answer and why? And it gives you the reference area. Now I'll admit, sometimes I even have to go back to the book to try and understand why the answer is what it is. Sometimes during class I miss practice questions that I go through, and that just speaks to the importance of practicing uh, the specific questions and types of questions. And the other thing that points out uh, that I'll go over in a little bit more detail later is um, you're not going to get all the questions on the exam correct. So, so that's something you have to kind of come to grips with. So you're not going to get all the questions right. So that's important for your uh, psychology. So again, um, as what I do is I map things out for folks. Okay, I'm going to study module one. I'm going to tell you to work the test. E-flash cards are great. So if you want to get into the calculations, it shows you how to do calculations. Helps you practice your calculations. There's flashcard formulas for all the formulas that you need. So there's just a wealth of resources here. And you can also download this as an ebook if you're on the road. So if you're on the road, um, you can download sections of this as an ebook and you can study when you're um, on the road, as fun as that might sound. So you can always be using your time to study for the exam, um, up to the exam. So again, this is just kind of the front page, but all these are valuable tools. Here's the pretest, it'll take you through. Um, the whole uh, sample the exam, it'll identify areas of strengths and weakness that you might need to work on, and it's very valuable in helping you prepare for the exam. Some people, what I ask them to do after I get to know them, I will ask them not to take the pretest um, until they're probably halfway through their study cycle, because the pretest can also be a tool to benchmark how, how, how much you still have to study. So, so some people know they're not ready at all. So I'd rather have them wait and take the pretest a month or two out, and then we can assess where they're at in terms of skills gaps and use that last month or month and a half to really dial in um, on areas that they might need. So again, just this is just a very brief um, overview, but again, there's a, there's, there's a pretest and then there's your post-test, post which you can take as well. So, and there are reports that you can get as well that'll help you identify areas where you might need um, more assistance in terms of your studying. So main tool here is great. Again, you have to purchase this. I would purchase the online tool. I think it's really invaluable in, in not only preparing you, but helping you with your confidence. A lot of the exam success is based on being confident. So I wouldn't say this is the only resource that you need. Uh, I tell people you shouldn't only take a five-day intensive course, but I think each of these should be a part of your toolkit that brings you confidence to your success. So anything you need to do to be confident to take the, ex the exam, I would do that. 
So look at the ROI to adding more and more tools. Again, each person I talk to individually because I think what each person needs is going to be different depending on where they're at and how much time they have to study. There's also a glossary um, as well, so you can look up um, any term that you want. So anything that as you're, reach, as you're working and studying, everything and the whole uh, body of knowledge that you need to know. And then there's also a resource center, so they have um, additional resources. Here's the test taking tips, any updates, um, reference materials. So there's a CTP test specifications, which tells you how the test is laid out. Here's one that I that I tell people to look at. There there is a certain sense. There's the ABCs of Treasury. So here are a lot of the acronyms um, that you might see in Treasury. So this is kind of our language of Treasury. So if you're not a Treasury person by trade or if you don't have quite as much experience, this is something that can help you uh, oftentimes just in terms of reading reading the question. So, you know, so this can be a very valuable tool as well. So let me take a pause here, take a breath. Just want to remind everyone, uh, please send me your questions in the questions box if you have any and then we'll, we'll get to those later. So I wanted to run through the AFP uh, learning system just really quickly because it, it's actually matured quite a bit in the last even five years or so. So AFP does do a really good job in giving you what I think is value for this online study tool and it's something that I incorporate into all the training um, that I do um, for the exam as well. So. So just uh, so that's a quick look there. So now we'll move on. So now let's get into more of the uh, soft skills. So let me talk about the psychology of the exam. These are things where I see people having trouble, and these are things you just need to realize, and these will help you in passing the test. Your testing environment is strange at best. So you will go into a test learning center. You will think you are going into FBI headquarters. They may even give you a... a uh, a, an eye scan now, I don't know how they do it, but once you walk into the testing center, I don't even think they allow you to have a notepad anymore for notes, and you will not be able to use your own calculator. So that environment is strange. So when you are taking a practice test um, through the AFP learning system or those 170 questions, what you want to do is put yourself in that same environment, that strange environment. Don't have the radio on and use the an online later. So you want to put yourself in the same conditions in which you will take the test. It will help put you at ease. It's amazing to me how I've asked people to to just, you know, take the test in those conditions and how and how, you know, it will impact their practice scores. It'll make them lower until they get used to that. So one of the things is that there are a lot of questions. So there are 170 questions. So you want to mitigate anything that's going to get you thrown off track. So if using that online calculator can possibly throw you off track, you want to eliminate that. So you want to identify some of these little um, inherent barriers to success and take all those down. A lot of people that I speak to who do not pass the test, they really don't pass by the margin is not, is not all that great. And so a lot of these tips that I offer help people in um, kind of getting over kind of the, the last mile, the last, some people 1%, 2%, 5%, some people it can be 50% just because they get themselves so thrown off of their game. So the other thing I mentioned is you're not going to get all the questions correct. I'm a perfectionist, so I had to uh, get myself to accept this fact. So you're not going to get all the questions correct. So that needs to help, you need to get yourself in that mindset. So if you get a question wrong on the exam, oh well. And you can't get yourself stuck on a question for five or ten seconds. I think the exact mathematics are that you have 40-something or 50-something seconds per question. And I, the rule that they usually say is you want to try and do them in 35 seconds or less. So that you can only do that if you work practice questions. So you want to get yourself going at a good even pace and give yourself time in order to go back and check your answers. And one of the cool things about the AFP CTP exam is you can actually mark questions and go back to them. And we'll talk about strategies 
on on what uh, on on how many questions you mark. So someone, I'll just jump in to questions because I want this to be a little interactive. So someone asks, what is the passing percentage? That's something that's not really published. So honestly, I don't know. Uh, I know that from what I've heard over uh, folks internationally, um, the passing percentage is relatively low. I would say based on my sample population and what I've heard in those markets, it's, it's well, well below 50%. So I think aggregate, if I had to give a number, again, don't hold me to this. This is just um, not based on facts. I'd say it's probably um, 50 to 50% 50 or so in, in that area. It can be as low as that area. So, you know, so all these little tips that I give you are going to help you get in that, you know, in that 50 or 60% um, passing rate. It's expensive to take the exam more than one time again. You're very vested in this, so you want to give it your best effort. Sometimes I've seen people that when they take it more, it becomes more challenging to them. So you want to, the next time you do the exam, you want to make sure you do everything possible to maintain your confidence. So that exam percentage, I can't tell you what that is, um, but what I can tell you is if you follow these tips that I give you, you're going to increase the probability uh, that you pass. There's also not a set percentage that you have to get right to pass the exam. So it's not like I can tell you, it, it's, the exam is scale. So each question is, is in theory one, one point, but the questions themselves are weighted. So a big calculation question will get a little bit more weight. So the scoring on that, it's, it's almost as if it is based on, on a curve. It's not a, it's not a strict curve. So there's not an exact answer. So I know we all like to get tied up in, if I get 80% right, I'm going to pass. If I get 70% right, I'm going to pass. What I can tell you is if you get 70% or more correct, I would be very surprised if you did not pass. So that, that's about as close um, as I can get. So, so again, you're not going to get them all right, but when you're taking your practice test, you need to get to as close to 100% as possible. Just keep working those tests and working them and working them and get as close as possible. And then at some point, you may get to the point where you're like, I just don't get this type of question. It's going to get me upset. So you just have to say, okay, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not going to get that answer right. And then we'll talk about how to choose the, choose an answer if you don't have any idea what the answer to the question is. So we'll teach you how to guess. Don't tell them I told you that AFP, but I'll teach you how to guess. So, so, so again, appreciate the questions. I had the exact same questions. I wish I had a solid answer for you, but um, that's as about as close as I can get. I, um, these things seem like common sense, but I had trouble with these myself. That's why I know they're issues. You need to stay focused for three and a half hours. That's not easy to do. It's certainly not easy for me to do. So I can't sit down, um, not have the music on, not have the phone, not get up and walk around. You have to stay focused for three and a half hours. So I would suggest that you actually have to practice that. So when you're taking a practice test, again, mimic those conditions. Here's another thing. You need to stay positive for three and a half hours. That's not easy to do either. So if you're taking a test, it's hard for you to say, okay, I get it. I'm positive. Okay, let's move on. Okay, I got number five right. Okay, number six. Number seven, yeah, yeah, stay positive. You, I'm trying to, not trying to be doc, Dr. Phil here, but you have to have a way to get yourself back into a positive mode. Sometimes you'll know you're getting a little question right. Oh, I know I missed those three questions in a row. Well, you're going to have to get over it because you're going to miss, you know, a number of questions. So one thing that you might do is instead of answering a question, you might skip a question and come back to it and get yourself to an answer that you know is right. Again, staying focused, staying positive, you need to stay confident so you can't start questioning all your preparation that you've done in the exam. So sometimes people talk themselves into the wrong answer. You have to stay confident for those three and a half hours. You need to move forward. All these are related, right? Stay focused, stay positive, stick to your plan, and maintain your pace. So some of these things seem like, I don't know, soft skills, cheesy things, but these things will be tremendously important. You will be amazed how much better you feel taking the exam if you actually think about these things beforehand you practice them, you know the conditions going in, you know how to stay focused, you have a few ways to keep yourself positive, you, you, you need to know how to snap yourself back into shape 
on the exam, let's say you're getting frustrated or you're talking, like me, if I'm talking right now and I'm going off the rails, oh, I need to get myself back on track. I better look at my slides. So I better get myself back on trail for this exam. You can say, okay, I'm, I'm, oh man, this, this question is throwing me out. Do you know how much money I spent for this stupid exam? I'm going to focus on this question. This thing, I'm going to get this thing done. It's, uh, I can't, have, you know, I'm going to get this thing done. And you need, like I said, you also need to um, maintain uh, your pace. So, so that's, so that's good. So another question coming in is around, um, how, you know, how long do you need to study for the exam? Uh, for me, that's a case by case basis. I recommend that people uh, give themselves at least two months to study for the exam. Two months, what I mean by two months, I mean you need to study for two months and there's weekly tasks you need to complete uh, for two months. So even after someone takes like a five day intensive course, I like them to still give themselves at least a two months and, and then take the exam after that. It's nice to have it fresh in your mind, but I always say I want people to take that intensive course. Say, okay, you go in with a certain amount of knowledge, maybe you haven't started studying yet, you go take your five-day intensive course, you get your content going, and then after you do that, then you really start hitting the learning system, um, boom, filling in the gaps, doing that. But I would give yourself enough time. And also, I like to give myself a couple extra weeks because you never know what life is going to throw in your way. So you want to give yourself some wiggle room uh, in case you don't have as much time as you'd like to study. One big piece of advice I would give you is when you plan to take the exam, make sure that you have the time to study. I actually took a few days off before the exam. So you want to make sure that you have, it's the right time for you to take the exam. So you might even, I know it costs money to change it or cancel the exam or postpone, but you want to make sure that when you take that, when you take the test, it's the right time for you to do so. Life happens, so don't let that get in your way and think you can cram for the exam. You have to be in the right mindset. If you have a life-changing event, something that's really going to stress you out, a family issue, you want to consider postponing taking that exam. It's not going to help you to take that exam if your mind is not focused on that. So that's, that's, uh, that's really important. So, so in terms of, um, again, going from questions here, which is awesome, there, you know, they, a lot of universities offer a CTP study course, so I'm not going to recommend any um, particular study course. What I can do is I can offer you what I think you need to cover, work with you on your CTP uh, study template. Um, if that's a conversation that you people would like to have with me off offline, I would be happy uh, to do that. Um, each, uh, even though the content's the same, each instructor is different in what they focus on. So what you need to what you need to decide, and I can help you do that, is what is it that's going to help Ernie pass the exam? Do I need someone who's going to go right out of the book, or do I need someone more who has more of a uh, a approach like Ernie? What Ernie does is Ernie wants to make sure I pass the exam. So Ernie focuses more on the questions, how to take the questions, um, more interactive conversations among the, the group in order to prepare you for the exam. So I would say which course is best depends on um, what you need. And also some people learn better. They can learn online as, a, as opposed to in person. Some people uh, learn um, better face to face. So sometimes they want that interaction and they need to be forced to sit down and stay focused. So again, it's also about uh, how you learn. So, so also you have to dis discover, okay, I, I, sometimes you can get yourself in a bad situation. I invest in this online course, and then I find out I just can't stomach this online. I need to do this in person. So once you make that leap, you can't really uh, back out. So again, each person is individualized. AFP offers some awesome materials, awesome tips on, in general, this works. But you need to figure out what works for you. So, so that's what I do for anyone who's taking the exam, but what I also do for um, folks that, that I train uh, myself personally. So let, I'll take a quick look uh, at my um, study template that I've shared with folks. Again, anyone who wants a copy of this. So what I do is I break down. What I did was I went back and I said to myself, if I was going to take the CTP exam and I had nine weeks to do it, what would I do? 
and I'm a very meticulous person. So I listed out all the all the tasks that I would do, and then I put them in week by week. So, so just for example, week one, okay, I want to review, and this is AFP Learning System. You'll notice I have hyperlinks in there, so it hyperlinks to either URLs or the learning system. So it says, okay, I'm going to take the quick start. Okay, I'm going to first of all, I'm going to review the video. I'm going to read, read the read the module chapter in the e-learning book. I'm going to complete the exam questions. I'm going to study the flashcards. I'm going to here's an important point. Take the module test open book. This is one thing I don't think very many instructors tell you to do. When you're taking practice questions, you need to be able to answer the questions with open book, open notes before you can answer them without. So, you need to I always tell people to do things open book and then closed book. If you can't do them with your book open, you have no chance of doing them when your book um, is not open. So you look at this and go, man, that's a lot of stuff to do. That's correct. However, this is what I believe needs to be done in order to prepare you for the exam. Some of these things take five minutes, ten minutes. You can knock these out. Some people can knock these out in a couple hours. But these are all the things um, that I would do and check, check these things off uh, as, I, uh, as I go along. Um, someone asked me a question about the chapters, uh, questions at the end of the chapters, if they're, maybe you have the, um, the body of knowledge book. Um, those questions are okay, but they're, I think they're very broad. So, I mean, they give you a good idea of the concepts in general, but at the end of the day, let's cut to the brass tacks here. You need to be able to answer the questions, the multiple choice questions, and those questions are a good way to make to ensure you understand the knowledge, but it's not going to help you how to answer the the questions the way they're asked in the multiple choice. It's there's just not apples to apples. So you will see that that is part of my things that you need to check off the box. But I would not get tied up there. If you if you want to make sure as you're going back and saying you know I haven't looked at domain two for a while, I want to go back and make sure I touched on that content. I would use those. But for me. Um, that's just not one of the tools that I that I really stress um, for folks. So in terms of studying smart, again we talked about this, control your study environment. I'm not saying that in general every week you can't, you know, sit around and have the radio on and do, and do all these things, but you want to make sure that you're not distracted as much as possible. It helps to develop a study routine. Um, one of the things that you want to do is you want to develop your question type IQ. We'll go over this in a, in a little while. There are certain types of questions that the AFP asks, and you want to make sure, okay, what is my IQ relative to these questions? Do I, have, do, I have an, do I have an affinity to get these right or get these wrong? And you want to make sure your, your question IQ is consistent across all question types, and you can work on that. So you have to get a little bit analytical on why you miss questions and how you answer questions. But again, for me, I do everything possible to mitigate the risk that I'm not going to pass. And that's what I advise people to do. And stick to your plan. If you have a plan and you're five weeks through and you're just nailing it, don't just decide you're going to take three weeks off because you're doing real well and then cram three weeks into the last week before the exam. That's something that you do not want to do. So so this, this is an investment. So you made an investment, right? Your money. Your time, time away from your family, time away from your job. So it's just critical that you look at this as an investment and do everything possible. And and I can say it, it may seem it may be the case that you do not pass the exam, and that's that's hard to swallow. But that's not the end of the world either. So so sometimes it just happens. But the good news is, I think now they give you some feedback on what areas that you that you might not have done as well on. So. And so that's awesome as well. Me personally, as an instructor, if someone does what I ask them to do and they don't pass the exam, then I'll pay for them to to, to uh, take the exam again. And I don't think anybody else does that. But that's just my philosophy. So, so folks, so so that's the confidence that I have um, in what I'm telling uh, people to do. That's our industry standard. So stick to your study plan. So if you take a course and and the guy gives you a, and if someone else gives you some a study plan, a study guide, a advice, stick to that. It, it, it will pay off more often than not. So let's take a quick look at some of the CTP exam question types. So first we'll get general and then we'll get into some specific 
uh, questions as well. Sometimes what I do with, with people is actually spend time with them on the phone doing this, going through specific questions. Sometimes I ask people to document like the questions that they get wrong. So, so I'll say you take module six and you, you make sure you screenshot every question that you get wrong and you and I are going to work through these questions because sometimes I have to help people figure out why they're missing a question and those are things that you can actually work on. Sometimes you talk yourself out of an answer, um, you read the question incorrectly, so there's just habits that we get into. So one of the things they have is they have uh, a closed question. So it's a complete question with four answers, only one is correct. So they give a, a simple example, red, yellow, green, purple. So generally I ask people, read the question once, read it slowly, don't try to read the question too quickly, don't try to answer the question before you've read the question. Answer the question as it is, not as you would like it to be. And some of the common mistakes that I see people make when, I'm, when they explain to me what they're doing is sometimes they won't read the question, uh, and they won't give it enough attention, or they'll miss words, like we'll get to accept only one of the following. It's easy to miss those words, especially if, you're go, if, there's, you know, you, if you put too much pressure on yourself in getting every question right. So that's a closed question. Um, open question is more of a, a definitional question. And then here I talked about accept. So that really gets, it amazes me how often people just, well, they want the answer, so they say accept. They don't really read. Our true accept, that is, that's why they put it in bold. They're giving you a, a fee, you know, accept uh, is a word. So, so again, be careful when reading the question. Um, there's item sets. So based on information contained in a, in a, in the following. So one of, one of the things I would call the item sets, which we'll talk about, which used to trip me up, is which of the following are true? Uh, it gives you one, two, three, four, one and two, two and three, three and four, four sometimes six. You know, those questions really, really uh, get people twisted up. And I'll tell you my secret to answering those questions. And I, this is, that tip I think has helped uh, quite, a, uh, quite a few um, people out. So let's just walk through a couple questions. I apologize. If this is easy for you and you know the answers, but I think getting you into this mindset is helpful. So here's what I just mentioned. Which of the following can be considered key responsibilities of daily cash management? Okay, one, overseeing compensation for bank services, management of short-term methods of borrowing, projecting future cash shortages, and surplus. So, so what do I do when I read these types of questions? If it's asking me, if I see it's going to be one of these wacky one, two, two, and times four, what I do is I read the question and then I go down each answer and I write next to it yes or no. If no, I scratch it off. If yes, I leave it unmarked. And then I go down and find the answer. If you go down, if you read the question, then go, go oh, I'm going to go one, okay, two, B, no, I'm going to go up and see if one and two are correct. You're going to waste a lot of valuable time. So I go down each, each answer individually and then I say, okay, that's true. That's true, and then, and then I read the, then I go to A, B, C, D, and find the answer. My answer is this: Where is it down here? I don't try because what you're doing is you're making the question four times longer than it needs to be. So in this case, okay, key responsibilities. Okay, I look. Okay, first one: Do I oversee compensation for bank services? Let me see. Um, yes, I do that. Okay, one's one's right. All right, I'll leave that on mark. Do I manage short-term borrowing and investing? Uh, yes. Okay, one and two are right. Three, no, don't go down and look at the answers yet. Don't, don't jump down to all the above or two and three. Work through the question. Projecting future surges, yes, right. Boom, one, two, three. They're all there. What does that say? D, boom, move on. That's the way to do those questions. So anytime, I think I can, if you do that, if you do it that way, I can almost guarantee I'll save you. Uh, you will get at least one or two, or if not more of those right, by just following um, that, that philosophy. So that's how I would go about that. Um, and then these next two questions are these qualifying type questions, which sometimes get tricky for folks. So which of the following contributes most to the marketability of security? So a couple keywords there. You want to say contributes and then most and then marketability. So this is kind of a tricky question. So again, I want to read through um, all the answers. So my first question is, okay, does this contribute to the marketability of security? Yes or no? Or do I know? Okay, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. So, so I go through each 
answer individually and I cross one. I, if I know one, so let me also go through how I get from get to an answer if I don't know. So if I read a question and, and I take my time and I read it and I have a strong feeling that I have the answer right, I circle, I check the answer and I move on. That, that's what I do. Because my, your first instinct is usually correct. So that's pretty much true across the board from what I've seen. So the, the next one would be, okay, I can start, I got four answers. Um, I, I know I, when I'm reading this, uh, I, I almost like my same philosophy from before. If I know one's not right, I'll just mark it off. Or if, I, if, if I'm not sure, I'll leave it. I'm not sure. So let's say for the sake of argument, okay, I read it through all these questions. Um, and this may not be the exact or right way to do it because I want to be mindful of our time. Okay, I get down to, okay, C and D, and then I qualify. Okay, um, you know, when I look at it, when I look at most and marketability, oh, yeah, in order to have marketability, you want to have a large market. So it gets me to D. So in some sense, you're playing a law of averages. If you don't have that initial gut reaction, boom, that's absolutely correct. Okay. Can I eliminate one answer? Okay, I have a better chance of getting it right if I get it down to three answers instead of four. If I get it down to two answers, I got a 50% chance. So there is an art to guessing. You're playing the probability game. So again, initial reaction, I got it, boom. Can I get it down to two answers? Yes. If I get it down to two answers, I read the question again and look for those keywords. In this case, most, marketability. Now I think both of these answers, they could be right, but you have to kind of get into the mind of the AFP a little bit and say most and marketable. And then when I have people take practice exams, I also uh, have them say when you're, when you're doing them through the system, when you get down to two answers and you're getting them wrong, let's start keeping track of that. And then we'll go over them. I'll go over that with people and see what it is that's tilting them uh, towards the wrong answer. And then this next example, optimal dividend policy is one that does all of the following except. So again, I would go through and say, okay, except, the except, it does not do this, okay? One way I do it was to say, okay, I want to find all the ones that that, that optimum, optimum policy does, so I'm looking for the exception. Okay, does A do that? Yes. Does B do that? Yes. Does C do that? Yes. Does C do that? Yes or no? It, it turns out to be the case that D does not do that because it does not balance tax shields benefits against agency costs. So again, there's general strategies that you can, that you can uh, follow. Um, another quick question we got in here, you do not get partial credit for an answer. So your answer is either right or wrong. So you have calculation questions and you either get the answers uh, right or uh, you get them wrong. So you, unfortunately, you don't get um, that partial credit. So there's different uh, um, levels of difficulty in the, in the calculation questions. So what I often uh, advise folks to do is if there's something you see as a complicated calculation question, I usually tell people to mark those and, and, and go through the test and come back and get to those complicated um, areas. Another thing that, that some people like to do is they'll spend the first five minutes or so doing a formula dump. So if you want to, first thing you want to do is sit down and maybe you do get a piece of paper. I think you do. Maybe get one piece of paper. You want to make sure you get those formulas down somewhere that you have memorized and if that gives you more confidence um, in those. So, so these next questions again are just um, things that I see that people um, sometimes get um, tripped in on. Again, tripped up on. If you look at the bottom, these are all questions in your exam prep guide, so the answers are there if I don't get through all these. But the reason I, the reason I picked 35 was that which of the following instruments best meets the objective? So again, you want to go answer by answer. Does it meet the objective? Yes, no. Okay, can I get from four to three um, to two? So again, it's, you want to look at um, that best answer. Um, the reason I showed number 40 was that 40 would be what I would consider a simple calculation. So some of the questions, um, if, if, you, uh, if you know the formula, you're going to get the answer correct. So, so they can be a given. So sometimes it might take you time to study.
to learn formulas, but sometimes that's a given. So in some cases, the formula is right. It's a give. It's a given for you. So if you need the formula, you're going to get it right. So I, I give the I, I tell people these are freebies. So you got to know the formula. Uh, one thing that you might when you're doing yield calculations, if if you don't see your answer, one thing that AFP does on their exam, you need to carry out your your answers to decimal. So if you round up or round down, you might not see the answer. So sometimes that gives people a little anxiety. So make sure that you take those decimals out three or four places when you're when you're doing um you know you're dividing a number by another number make sure you take uh, those those decimals out and sometimes in bond and t-bill calculations sometimes it can be just because you're using the number 360 instead of the number uh, 365 so and the 98 I put on there was because of the word key so again is it right is it wrong but then if I can get it down to two uh, which one gives me uh, which is the answer um, that I'd like to see. So again, 101, another one of my favorite questions. So we got a one, two, three, four question. So again, which of the following do I want? Is it true? Is it not true? You know, yes, no, boom, boom, boom. So when I get down to number three, uh, which of the following optimal uses for short-term excess cash? Oh, look at that. Well, that, it's not to make capital expenditure, so I mark three and four out. And then I look, oh, which one has one and two? That would be A. Um, next couple of these are, um, so these are questions that are related. So it might be the case that you might have two questions related to one chart. Um, those are questions that I might, if I don't get it right off the bat, I might consider uh, one, one, I might consider skipping the questions and, and going back to those and making sure I have time to give them the time uh, that they need. So let me move past some of these questions and get to some general tips and give us, get into a little bit more of the soft side and then give you the opportunity to ask questions. Again, general tips, if you have a strong instinct, pick it and move on. If you have it down to two answers, read the question, pick an answer, move on. That's the key to every question. Once you have your answer, move on. You can flag it to check it again if you really, really want to do it or you want to skip it. But don't go, don't, don't go back and change like 35 of your answers for questions you had a strong instinct on. Uh, three would be you have no idea. Start eliminating choices one by one. Going from four to three and four to three to two really improves uh, your odds. So again, you can learn how to make mistakes. How you make mistakes, sorry. Practice, practice, practice. And, and there's tips in, in, within AFP to show you how to do that. They have a smart study tool. And I also work with people to help them learn how you make mistakes. Again, you're not going to get all the questions right. So if you have patterns in, in the ways that you might answer questions incorrectly, you can recognize those and you um, can fix those. And you want to learn what types of questions trouble you and which areas trouble you. In terms of content, I seem to see uh, quite a bit of people have a little bit more trouble on module three, which is, I believe, working capital um, than most modules. So, so you want to focus in areas that might give you um, a little bit trouble. Those will take you a little bit um, longer um, to get through. And then if questions trouble you, and like I said, and you're, you're getting yourself in a bad place, you want to flag it and move on and mark it and go back to the question. Anything you can do to keep yourself on task, positive, not get yourself frustrated. A frustration leads to wrong answers. I can tell you that from experience. So the more and more frustrated you get, the more and more questions you're going to answer um, incorrectly, and that's going to be solely due to your um, the, your frame of mind. So some of these things seem like okay, I know, but I know that. Well, when you when you get into it and you start studying, you do things you kind of forget. So you need to take a look at these things. You you have to have a time management in your mind when you're taking the test. So you want to develop a strategy that works for you in time management, but again, don't get stuck on one question, don't get stuck in a rut, don't be afraid to flag a few questions. Uh, you need to be able to maintain a consistent pace. Yeah, that's a pace. Pace and temperament. Yes, you can. I, I, would, uh, I, would, I would say that even though you have to have, you have to have a good pace, you have to give yourself a pout break. So if you're just getting really cheesed off about something and you're frustrated, just sit there and look at your, if you can't have a watch or whatever, and just breathe for 30 seconds. Give yourself, say, okay, I'm going to pout for 30, 30 seconds. This exam is really cheesing me off. 
this thing, and then get over it. So you, and it sounds dumb, but it actually works. It's actually funny. So you can actually make yourself laugh by thinking about that. But you can give yourself uh, your little pout breaks. Because what happens is you might spend 30 seconds on a pout break, get your, and then that's going to save you the answers that are going to help you um, uh, pass the exam. So these are some of um, my final thoughts before I take a couple questions. Um, first and foremost, what someone needs to do to pass the CTP exam is not the same for everyone. I hopefully I've made that clear. However, um, some 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 common pit there are common pitfalls, and I think my opinion, you should pay attention to best practices. Um, you should learn how you trip yourself up. Learn how to get out of your own way. You should have a study plan. You should not attempt the exam if you do not have the time to prepare for the exam. Do not cram and do what it takes to be prepared so you can remain calm and confident for three and a half, maybe four hours to give you to read as well in the exact setting conditions you will face. So I hope that that uh, content has been helpful. Again, it's more um, soft skills, but these are the things that I think help people um, get over the hump. And again, I'm happy to speak with anyone offline about any topic. They're looking to take a course from someone somewhere. They may want to have some instruction time with me. Ha happy to do that as well. Happy to work with groups. I know there's some study groups we have on the call today. So I'm very happy to do that. Um, so one final call for questions. Um, with that, I'm going. What I'm going to do at this point is I am going to just offer um, my philosophy and how I do things. So feel free to uh, jump off the line. I have a little marketing person in me, so my apologies, but I would like to uh, just share what my value proposition is for helping people pass the CTP exam. And with that, I'm going to play the video. And passing any professional certification exam is tough. And a CTP is no exception. It is an art, and you need a CTP Picasso with unparalleled vision, creativity, and treasury knowledge. And that is Ernie Humphrey, the CEO of Treasury Dimension. I take unparalleled personal accountability for each and every one of my CTP programs. If anyone takes my CTP training and does not pass the exam, I will pay for you to take the exam. Part of my customized training includes an individual CTP battle plan, which is an individual battle plan for success I develop with each and every person that I train. Another key component of Ernie's unique value proposition is that he is currently working on the committee which is updating AFP's body of knowledge which is the foundation for the content for the CTP exam. The AFP is the sponsoring organization for the CTP exam, and few people know the AFP better than Ernie Humphrey. Ernie served as the Director of Treasury Services at the AFP, and Ernie also served on AFP's Corporate Treasurer's Council. Ernie has a true passion for Treasury, and is a nationally recognized thought leader, and that is why he has been a sought after public speaker for both AFP national and regional events over the past 10 years. On this slide, you will just see a few of the events and organizations Ernie has supported over the past 10 years. Ernie has extensive experience as a corporate treasury practitioner in arenas including cash management, risk management, benefit plan administration, financial reporting, and acquisition integration. In addition to his extensive experience in the corporate treasury arena, Ernie has an unparalleled commitment to support the professional development of corporate finance professionals. During his career, he has developed over 400 seminars and webinars that were specifically designed to impact the career success of corporate finance professionals. Ernie has the passion, knowledge, and availability, and the training talent to help anyone with a true commitment to passing the CTP exam. If you want to learn more about Treasury Dimensions and how we fuel CTP exam success, please contact me 
at Ernie at TreasuryDimension.com or give me a call at your convenience. Thank you very much, everyone, again, for your time and make the